מסכת בבא בתרא, דף כ"ג, מרחיקין את השובך מן העיר חמישים אמה. If I want to put a dovecote out in the unsettled area, it has to be far from a city at least 50 אמות, so that my doves won't fly and eat people's seeds, people who live in the town, and they have seeds around, so then my bird's going to go and take it. So if I leave it 50 אמות away, that'll be far enough that my birds won't go and take them. ולא יעשה אדם שובך בתוך שלו, אלא אם כן יש לו חמישים אמה לכל רוח. And furthermore, I cannot build a dove coat within my own field unless there are 50 אמות to in all directions. Again, so that the doves that are in my dove coat will not fly 50 אמות to someone else's field and eat the seeds that are in their field. רבי יהודה אומר, בית ארבעת קורין מלא שגר היונה. רבי יהודה disagrees and says, no, you need a lot more space than that. It has to be the area that you would use to plant four cord, which is equal to as far as a dove can fly in a single flight. And this is several times larger than 50 amot. And the last law is that if I buy a small field with a dove coat on it, even if it's as small as just a quarter, uh, a size of land in which you would plant a quarter cup of seed, then I, I also take with it the chazaka. In other words, if I'm buying the small piece of land that has a dove coat on it, I can assume that the previous owner got rights from the neighbors to have a dove coat there, even though he does not have the requisite space all around. So when I buy it, I not only buy the land and buy the dove coat, I also buy the right to have the dove coat there close to the neighbors. And so I can keep it there and the neighbors cannot make me take it down. We ask, חמישים אמה ותולה ורמין היא אין פורסין נשבין ליונים אלא אם כן היה רחוק מן היישוב שלושים ריס. The Mishnah started off saying, if I have a dove coat in the wilderness, I have to put it, make sure that it's 50 amot away from the closest city. We challenge this from a Mishnah in Baba Kama that says regarding traps, I cannot put a trap for a dove unless it's at least 30 iris away from the nearest settled town, which is 8,000 uh, amot. That's many, many times more than 50 amot. And so that's how far we suspect that birds are going to come, uh, travel. And uh, if I'm putting a trap, that closer than that, then I'm going to be trapping other people's birds because they travel around. I can put a trap out in the middle of the wilderness, very far from the city where the people's birds are. Those are surely uh, birds that no one owns. So here in our Mishnah, it says regarding a dovecote, 50 amot, but in the Mishnah Baba Kama, regarding a trap, it says 8,000 amot. So that's a big difference. Amar Abaye, Meshat Shaiti Tuba, Uchresayu Bachamishim Amta Malya. Abaye explains that doves actually travel very far. They can travel, yep, 8,000 amot. And if I put my trap any closer, it'll trap birds that belong to individuals. However, once it starts flying, it's going to eat along the way, and its stomach is already full after 50 amot. It's picking up food as it goes along, and that's it. After 50 amot of travel outside the city, it already got all the food that it needs, and it's not going to eat anymore. That's why both of these laws make sense for a trap that has to be 8,000 amot because it does fly that far. But in terms of a dovecote and worrying about that what it's going to eat, it's going to have its it's going to be full already a 50, in a fifty amot a fifty amma radius, and therefore as long as nobody else's land is in within a fifty amma radius of my dovecote, I'm okay. ומשת שלושים ריס ותולה, והתניה ביישוב אפילו מאה מיל לא יפרוס. Hold on, we have a question about that very Mishnah in Baba Kama, because there is a Braita that says that if I'm in a settled area and I want to put a trap, then even a hundred mil is not sufficient. And it can go because birds fly. And other people's birds that don't, are owned by individuals will come and fly even a hundred mil, much, much more. So the eight, even 8,000 amot would not be sufficient. Rav Yosef Amar Bishuv Keramim. Rav Amar Bishuv Shovachin. So Rav Yosef explains that when this, this Braita is talking about a place that's settled with vineyards or a place that's settled with dovecotes, because there's vineyards 
vineyards or dovecotes along the way so the birds can fly and rest for a little and keep flying and in that case they can go even more than a hundred meal and so if it's settled with uh, uh, vineyards or with other dovecotes then I cannot put my trap even a hundred meal but um, as if it's means settled means there's a town and then there's empty space in between then they that's 8,000 amot because without the places to rest in between it will only travel not uh, up to 8,000 amot now a question on Rava he said that there are shavachim all along the way if so I I wouldn't be able to to keep it uh, to put my trap 8,000 amot from the city if there are other dovecotes all along the way because I'm going to have to keep it far from the f- nearest dovecoat. Um, and so uh, for every dovecote, I'm going to have to keep moving it, uh, moving my dovecote even further, or my trap rather, even further than that dovecote, 8,000 amot. And so if, it's, if there's a, um, dovecotes all in between, then it would not be sufficient to have um, even 8,000 amot from the city. It would have to be 8,000 amot from the, from the uh, dovecote that's farthest out. And so we answer, No, it could be that all the dovecotes that are on the way are my own. And so that's why um, I'm not, st- like, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't be stealing from myself. If I own all the dovecotes in between, uh, then I just have to keep my trap 8,000 amot from the city. Or all of those dovecotes are owned by a Nanju, and that would not be considered stealing. Or they are ownerless. They're just there, and nobody owns those dovecotes. In that case, I could put my trap 8,000 amot from the city, where there are uh, birds that are owned by individuals, and I don't have to worry about all the birds that are in the dovecotes along the way. But indeed, if someone else, a Jew, owned those dovecotes, then I would have to keep my trap 8,000 amot from that nearest dovecote. Rabbi Yehuda Omer Bet Arba'at Korin Vechule. So Rabbi Yehuda said that you need even more, not more than 50 amot on each side. You need the amount of space that you would use to uh, to, to seed for kor. And then is the, uh, the next halacha is what we're going to analyze. If I buy a, a land that's even smaller, um, but uh, the previous owner had a dovecote there, and so therefore has a chazaka that he's allowed to have that dovecote there. He got permission from his neighbors or they never complained. And so if I buy that field, then I acquire with it also the right to keep the dovecote there, even though it does not have sufficient sufficient distance to the next neighbors. So the papas uh, and some say Rav Zavid said, we can learn from our Mishnah that the Betin will make a claim on behalf of a buyer or on behalf of an heir. Let's explain. If someone has a chazaka, they, they're, they're, they're squatting on the land for three years and nobody complains. It doesn't automatically become theirs. That's, uh, it just means that they don't have to bring proof, but they still have to provide a claim of how they got it. So uh, if I'm on someone's land for three years and no one complains, and then someone says, hey, well, you know, how'd you get this land? I have to explain either that I bought it or I got it as a gift or I inherited it and um, I've been here for three years. So you need both a claim and a physical chazaka of living there. So now if someone uh, 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 either, I, I bought a field from someone who was sitting there for three years or I inherited a field from someone else, who uh, who was uh, on the field for three years. Now, I don't necessarily, as the buyer, as the heir, I don't necessarily know where the original owner, how he got it, whether that person bought it, got it as a gift or whatever. And I don't need to know. That's what this means. If I buy or inherit a field from someone who had a chazaka, then the betin can fill in the claim and say, well, you don't have to know. We can assume that the person that you got it from, they themselves, got it in a legal way they bought it they got it as a gift they they inherited it and um, uh, the person who the the last person who has it well the person who has it now does not need to make a claim on behalf of the previous owner the betin can fill it in so we can learn from here that we do that well, how do you know from here because this Mishnah teaches if I buy a small piece of land with a dove coat on it and the previous owner had a right to keep that dovecote there, then I inherit that right. 
and I don't have to know how the previous owner got that right, if he had it for a long time, if he negotiated, if he uh, um, made a deal with the neighbors, it doesn't matter. I don't need to know. I just know that the previous owner had it, and, and now I bought it, so I inherit that right. Yoresh Tanena. And now we ask uh, uh, against Rapapa. Rapapa, is this Mishnah the source that the Betin makes a claim on behalf of the buyer and on behalf of the inheritor? We already learned that principle with regard to an inheritor, at least, from a Mishnah that's coming up later that teaches Habamishim Yirusha and No Sarich Ta'ana. Someone who comes and claims this is mine because I got it as an inheritance does not have to make a claim on how the bequeather himself got it. He says, listen, I know that person was an owner, and now I got it from that person. How, how did, what about that person? Where did they get it from? Uh, the Betin will fill in the claim, however they got it. And so we already know this principle regarding Yoresh. So we answer, Okay, fine. Our Mishnah over here needs to teach us that this principle is true regarding a buyer. But that also, a Mishnah later on, on Daf Samech, teaches that if I buy a courtyard and it has projections or balconies, um, so this, we assume, is uh, it can be used by the person that buys that courtyard. Um, so it has uh, things sticking out on, uh, of it into the uh, into the, the shutara beam i can go and hang things on there or if there's a balcony that sticks out so we can assume that just like the previous owner had a presumption that he is allowed to use that even though it's sticking out into the shutara beam he got permission to use that i buy this courtyard together with the projections and the balconies i inherit that right i i buy that right i get it also and I don't have to make any claim about how the previous owner got that right. So we see here also, we already, we already know that one uh, does not, the Bretin will make a claim on behalf of a buyer. So why do I need our Mishnah here since I can already derive it from those Mishnayot later? And the answer is, I do need it. If I only had the later source regarding someone who buys something and there's things sticking out uh, or, uh, uh, or a balcony, if over there where it's, where it's dealing with something sticking out into the public domain, we might have said there the Betin will make a claim on behalf of the buyer because it could very well be that the previous owner actually built that wall, the wall of that courtyard, within his domain. He pulled it back into his domain, uh, far uh, a, a few feet far from the border, and he built the projectiles or the balcony still on his own land. And since that could very well be, so he uh, that that's easy for the betting to make a claim. Or maybe the public uh, waive their, their right and say, we don't mind that you have something sticking into the Shut Rabim. We're okay with that. So since there, it's, it could very well be that the, the previous owner has a full right to use those projectiles. That's where the Betin makes a uh, Ta'ana on their behalf. But here, where it's an individual who has a dove coat in a relatively small piece of land, and it's bordering on someone else's private land, so then there's less. It's less likely to um, uh, to claim that that person uh, waived their right, or uh, or that it can't be that I I, I put my border within, uh, pulled my border in. There's no, it doesn't work for this case because the other person's border is within 50 amot from this dove coat. And so since these, both of those claims cannot apply in our case, I might have thought that this case is less likely um, for the previous owner to have had that right, and therefore the Betin will not make a claim on behalf of a buyer. And that's why I need this Mishnah to teach us that even in this case, the Betin will, we assume that that claim and the buyer does not have to prove where the seller got it from. And if I only had this source, this our Mishnah here, since I'm dealing with an individual neighbor, it could be that I spoke to him and I peased him and he agreed and he was fine with me putting a dove coat close. Or, or he was 
waived his right. I never spoke to him, but I put it there and he didn't care about it. And so it could be with one person I negotiated and he's okay with it. But with, if I have a balcony sticking into the public domain, there's no individual that I could negotiate with. Who is there that could be appeased or that would, that would yield and say, okay, it's talking about the whole public. So it's less likely that the previous owner has a legitimate right to have his balcony sticking into the Shut Abim. I might have thought in that case that the Betin does not make, assume a claim on his behalf. And that's why I need both this source and that other Mishnah, Sericha. Harehu Bechezkato. Our Mishnah taught that if I buy a small field with a dovecote in it, then I can also buy the right to keep that dovecote, even though it's less than 50 amot from my neighbor. Hold on. But Rav Nachman, in the said in the name of Rabbah Bar Abu, that we, there is no chazaka for damages. If I keep on damaging your field, I keep on running over your flowers in your driveway, and I'm doing this for years and years. So you can always come and stop me. And says, well, but I've been doing this for so many years. Don't I uh, have a right, a assumed right, a chazaka? No, there's no chazaka for damages. And if we apply that here also, so just because for a long time, the guy that I bought it from has uh, been, uh, has had this Dove coat that's been close by and taking this guy's my neighbor his neighbor's seeds and he's been doing that for a long time. Does that mean that he acquires a chazaka and now that I buy it I get it also? No, this is damages and therefore the neighbor can come any time and say, "Hey, you're within fifty amot. Your bird is taking my seeds and you have to stop it." And the answer is that Rav Mari said that Rav Nachman's rule only applies regarding smoke. And Rav Zivid says it only applies regarding an, an outhouse. Only in these two cases where I have smoke coming out of a kiln or I have an outhouse near you and uh, you, don't, you didn't mind, you didn't say anything for, uh, for three years. Nevertheless, there's no chazaka. You can come anytime and say, you know what? I want you to get this away from me. But it only applies to these cases, not to everything. And so regarding um, you know, the birds, if you tolerated it for three years, then there is a chazaka for Nizakin for such a case. And if I buy it, I inherit that right as well. Mishnah. Nipul animsa betocha mishim ama. Harehu shel baal hashobach. If you have a chick that does not fly, so it can't go very far, it can only hop around a little. And we find someone finds it on the floor within 50 amot of a dovecote. So that has to be returned to the owner of the dovecote. He owns it because we assume that it fell out of the dovecote and it hopped around a bit, but it belongs to the owner. The pers- and someone else who finds it has to return it. However, if someone finds it farther than 50 amot from the dovecote, then whoever finds it can keep it because it's unlikely that a chick would have traveled that far. Let's say there's two uh, dovecotes that are both uh, and uh, uh, that are both nearby um, with, and uh, within within a. 50 amar amar radius, the 50 amar radius of both of them overlaps, and you find a dovecote, so it's both within 50 amot of this and 50 amot of the other one. So both uh, owners will have a claim. So the answer is we see who is it closer to, even though it's 40 amot to yours, but it might be 30 amot away from mine. So therefore, it's more likely it came from mine. So we go by the closest. If it's exactly in between my dovecote and your dovecote, then we divide the value of that chick. Rabbi Hanina says a general rule. If, on the one hand, you have a majority, um, and the majority claims one way, um, if, you know, those, if you go by the majority of, we'll see some examples. Whereas if you go by the closest, then that would claim someone that someone else it belongs to somebody else. Then we go by the majority. The majority is more important than that which is uh, than what is closest to. And even though uh, the majority is a deodaita principle, right? Achare uh, rabim um, and looking at where uh, something is closest to is also a deodaita principle, as we're about to see. 
So they're both Torahite principles. You might say they're equally strong. No, nevertheless, the rule of the majority is stronger. And so we'll see uh, from the following question, uh, an example and the source, that something that's closer belongs to that, that person or that city. Regarding Egla Arufa, a murder mystery, we find a body, we don't know who killed it. So we go to the closest city, and they have to come out and do the ceremony and say, you know, the elders come and say, we are not responsible. Basically, the closest city, we attribute that the murderer is likely to have come from the closest city. And that's true, even if there is another city that might be a little farther away, but let's say it's double or triple the population. So if you look at the majority, there's a lot more people in the farther city. And so in terms of the majority, it's more likely that the murderer came from the bigger city. Uh, nevertheless, we follow the one that's closest. So this is a challenge against Rabbi Hanina's rule that we always follow the majority. Here, we ignore the majority and we go by what's closer. And the answer is Bedeleka. This Pasuk is assuming that is assuming that there is no other town that is bigger that's anywhere nearby. And that's why we go with the closest city. But you're right. If there was a bigger city, then we would go with the majority, even if it was a little bit farther. So we say, we ask, In that case, if you always follow the majority, follow the majority of the world, right? The closest city has 10,000 people in it. The, but if you go by the whole rest of the world, that, I don't know, in those days, maybe it had 50 million people in it. So if it's more likely that the murder came from the 50 million, in out somewhere anywhere in the world rather than the 10,000 in the closest city and so then therefore we should fa- assume that the murder came from anywhere else uh, from somewhere else and not from this city and then you would never have an igladufa because you could always assume that it came from somewhere else and not the and not the city that's nearby so we answer Beyoshevet ben Heharim. When does a Gladufa apply to the closest city? When that city is between mountains, meaning it's closed off and it's very difficult for it to have any travel from the rest of the world to the murder mystery site. Um, and only that city is with is nearby and uh, is within that mountain range, um, uh, so that the, if whoever the murderer is must have most likely came from, come from that city that's closest, because the whole rest of the population of the world is beyond the mountains that are hard to travel to. So we answered that question. Tenan. So we ask another question against Rabbi Hanina's uh, uh, opinion from our Mishnah that says a chick that is found within 50 amot of a dovecote, so that belongs to the owner of the dovecote. Even if, let's say, there's another dovecote that's much bigger, meaning it has a lot more birds in that one. So if you go by the majority, you say, well, the majority of birds must be from the one that has so many, even though if it's a little, even though it's a little farther. So you see that in this Mishnah, we thought we go with the closest, not with the majority. A challenge to the Bichanina that said the opposite. And we answer, Bideleka. No, we're talking about a case where there are no other dovecotes around. And therefore, finders keepers, because um, if it's not from this dovecot, because it's 50 a month away, more than 50 a month away from it, and it can't be from anybody else because there are not other, no, no others around. But you're right. If there were other big ones around, then the finder would not be able to keep it. We ask, Hold on. Look at the continuation of the Mishnah that teaches if the chick is found more than 50 amot away from that particular dovecote, then finders keepers. But if there are no other dovecotes anywhere nearby, then for sure it came from that dovecote and you would have to uh, return it to the owner of that dovecote, even though it's more than 50 amot away from it, because where else could it have come from? And the answer is Hacha Baiskinan Bim Dade Damar Rab Ukva Bar Ochama Kola Midade and Midade Yotemachamishim. And we answer we're talking about a chick that can only hop and cannot fly. And Rab Ukva Bar Chama said that any chick that can only hop and cannot fly cannot hop more than 50 amot. And therefore, 
if it's found more than 50 amot away from the chick. I don't know where it came from. It came from somewhere, uh, but it definitely did not come from this dove coat because it couldn't possibly travel that far, and therefore, finders, keepers. Rabbi Yermia has a famous question or infamous question. He says, what if? Someone comes and finds a chick and one leg is within 50 amot of someone else's dove coat, but one leg is right outside the border of 50 amot from that dove coat. Then what? On the one hand, one leg is in, so does that mean it belongs to the owner of the dove coat? But one leg is out, so does that mean finders keepers? Uh, good question, right? Wrong. That's not a good question. When the BMIA asked that, they felt that, that he was a mocking question, um, that uh, he was mocking the way the rabbis are so precise. Exactly 50 amot. Well, what if it's one leg in, one leg out? The truth is, look, for every law in every any legal system, you always have to have a cutoff point, right? And this is allowed, and then more is not allowed, right? This much you have to pay tax. More than that, you don't have to pay tax. Everything is going to be some number, even though it's just one cent off, that makes a difference between something allowed and something not allowed, right? A minute before Shabbat starts, it's okay. A minute after Shabbat starts, and that, that's it. That is Shabbat. Okay, but it was only one minute difference? Yeah, uh, that's uh, that makes all the difference. And so uh, the rabbis felt that Yudhibiyah was asking a question in a mocking way. And so they kicked him out of the Bet Midrash, which is a nice Midah Kenegen Midah. Since he was talking about a chick that is one foot in, one foot out, they said, okay, you're one foot out, and they kicked him out totally from the Bet Midrash. And that will be a lesson. Baruch Adonai Amen v'amen.